Yeah, I became an agent in 2000 um, and crossed over. I sort of had always assumed that I would do that. At some point, I didn't realize it would be so early, and it was really for logistical reasons um, that are probably too <laughs> complicated to go into here. Um, but I was lucky that I made that change when I did because a whole uh, bunch of changes were, were, uh, were, were overcoming the publishing industry at that time, um, sort of some of which were possibly negative. And on a positive note, Michael Cater had started Publishers uh, Marketplace at that point, which made it a very propitious time to become an agent and start off on even footing with a lot of people who had a lot more experience and had sold more books. Um, so that on the database, we all sort of appeared for, for you know, more or less on even footing. Um, uh, I worked first with a firm called Palmer and Dodge, which was a literary agency that was part of a uh, white shoe Boston law firm. Um, and it was a sort of branch of that law firm that was uh, the people that I'd done business with when I was at Doubleday. And um, they represent E.O. Wilson and uh, now, most recently, Matthew Desmond, who just won a Pulitzer for nonfiction, and um, uh, the estate of Louisa May Alcott, and um, it's a quite a distinguished list, um, both in fiction, and they represent Robert Pinsky in poetry, and uh, a lot of social scientists, historians, um, and so on, and so I thought that would be a good place to cut my teeth, and that is where I worked with Jill Neerim and Ike Williams uh, before launching my own agency in 2003, which has grown since then. In 2012, we acquired a, a, an old agency that had been founded in two, uh, 1940 called Russell and Volcany. And they had a really distinguished list of uh, backlist uh, classics. Uh, the works of Eudora Welty, Barbara Tuckman, um, Nadine Gordimer, George Plumpton. And so we've been kind of stewarding that very distinguished older list along with our, the list that we're growing with present day scholars, writers, poets, memoirists. Um, so um, I find when I do these things that a lot of the best parts of the conversation come from the Q and A. Um, so rather than try to carve out something to say at you right now, I'll just move it along and then, but I'll be eager to answer any questions. Uh, as Allison said, I'm, I'm Pat Allen. I'm an acquisitions editor at the University of Georgia Press, and I specialize in um, books that are for the general educated reader. It's a sort of amorphous category of smart people who read, uh, have a particular interest in a subject, whether that's architecture, decorative arts, uh, history, and non sort of a non specialist history. And, and by that I mean it is, um, it sounds so patronizing, but it's free, it's free of jargon, it's free of. Uh, theory, but it still delves into the historiography and it's still um, a solid work of scholarship. For example, one of the books that um, uh, the press has done, I've done some of them, some of them I did not do, are um, identification guides, nature identification guides. They're written on sort of the level of a newspaper article, maybe for a, a ninth grade uh, reader, but the most eminent uh, herpetologist in the southeast um, has done these books. So that's the kind of books that I look for, books that I know the scholarship is unassailable, um, but they're going to have a wide readership among, um, you know, in, in, in the region or, or nationally. Um, what else shall I say? Well, I, I know that one of, the, one of the questions that Allison has been, had been directed to her that she wanted us to, to say is to, to speak about was how to get the right press for your book. And um, the classic answer, well, you, you have a very different perspective about this than I, than I might have. Um, many of the books that, w that we do are written, as I said, by scholars for general audience. And um, those are, it's kind of a, um, a writing community that's really not, um, that doesn't really seek out um, representation by an agent at all. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And um, there you know, are advantages and disadvantages of that to the writer. What I always tell people in this sort of forum, how to find the right press for you, is simply to go to your bookshelf and find books that you like. And what is the imprint on the spine of that book? Um, flip through the um, acknowledgments and you'll find 
my name or Rob's name or another editor or agent, and you can, you know that that person, agent or editor, gets the kind of work that you do. And you just track, you hound them and Google them down, you sleuth around and contact them that way. And when you do contact that agent or editor, and I think it's sort of, you feel sort of a kinship with them, or you really feel that they get your work. I think that's really important, that they respond to you in a timely way, if they seem to anticipate the kinds of things that you're going to say in the discussion. I think that means that you probably have a pretty good home. How do I know when a project is right? And you may have the same kind of feeling. It's what Justice Stewart said about obscenity. I don't, I only, I just see it and I know it immediately. It fits into our list. It fits into the strengths of the university. So it rises, it sort of embiggens, to use a Simpsons word, it embiggens both of us. It makes the university look good, it makes the press look good, and hopefully it'll be a book that will make money for the press. I can say this because Walter is not here. He does lots of monographs, scholarly books that really are the mission of the press, but the finances of them are a little bit different than the books that I acquire. They're wonderful, important books, but they're not money makers in the traditional sense. Well, I don't know. I like where you were going also about flipping through the acknowledgments to try to, I mean, helpfully, sometimes the authors don't specify who Joe Schmo is, that Joe Schmo is actually the agent. So you won't, they won't, but if you, you can do some deduction by cross-referencing that with this site that I mentioned, Publishers Marketplace. I don't know if you all are familiar with this. Michael Cater started this in 2000, and it really has become a clearinghouse, a watering hole, a digital, not just a digital sort of trade outlet, but also a database receptacle for all of the history since then in terms of who's who, who's doing what, which houses and editors are looking for what. And so between, you know, availing yourself of those databases, and you can cross-reference to the different search terms and in different categories, plus, for instance, your own bookshelf, which I think in the end is the best way, but you may need a little bit of refinement just to figure out who these names are. Because sometimes they'll just list names. We'll give you an idea. And I think it's doubly useful because when someone like Patrick or me or any other agent or editor is culling through the traffic of email and outreach and queries, when it's framed with specifics, that is so much more useful. Not because it's flattering that you might recognize Carol Anderson or some name that someone has worked with, not just because of that, although of course we're all human beings, so that probably is an active dynamic as well, but just because it feels that homework has been done, that this has been thought through, and it lends a certain credibility to the pitch that you are making as a scholar, as a writer, reaching out to a publishing professional. And I think the likelihood of success is increased, maybe even immeasurably by that, just simply taking the time. You may get emails like this, I open up to dear editor. Right. Or even worse when you have, and then we'll stop because this is probably not very nice, but when you get an email with literally 75, like you can't see it, so many they don't fit, but you know that if you scroll there would be 75 or 500 agents, that doesn't help anyone. And again, it's, you know, honestly it's one of these things where we are human beings and that, even if at the end of that whole scrolling process was the germ of a good idea or a good idea, it's just simply possible, everyone's human, that that might have been the thing that clicked that you thought next. You're always looking for a reason to move things along and when you get, you know, 100 or 200 or more emails, you know, in a day, a week, whatever it is, you're looking for ways to just move things and you don't want to give someone that easy way out, you know. Yeah. 
Exactly, and that ensures that all those people in that long list ignore you. you know, every single one of them. They will. Yeah. Chances are, they'll all have the same response. It's yeah. sort of, it, it's, it's, it's almost heartbreaking. It's either annoying or heartbreaking, or some combination of the two. I think it's annoying. Okay. Maybe you're more feeling than I am. I, I think it's just that one. Um, so, if I can get down to nitty gritties, it's uh, once you find that that press, and, and maybe this is also true, and please jump in if you disagree, you know, how do you make the pitch? And um, first of all, it is a pitch. I mean, you're trying to sell something to someone, and um, especially I think in the, in the university press world where we're in this lofty world of ideas, um, people are sort of eschew that a little bit. But you're, you're pitching, you're trying to sell something to someone, and um, both sell them on the idea of working with you and literally sell them um, the books that you're, in, you're in, going to enter into a business relationship with. So, um, you know, put yourself in the mind of a salesperson that you are selling a product to someone and it is your intellectual product, but it's a product nonetheless. For me, the most important element of a, uh, of a, uh, of a package that I get is the cover letter. And in that, I want to get, you know, the elevator pitch or the, the two sentence pitch where you know I can get a distillation of an idea that's very very brief, and I uh, I know what that is, and um, you may have a, a very complicated idea, and just in the course of the business day, as you were saying earlier, Rob, you've got to be able to give it to us in a way that's digestible and that we can easily comprehend. Um, so give me the idea, and then give, me, and, and that includes both the scope of the book, the, all the things that you might involve. If it's an historical period. What is the period that you're covering, and then what within that period are you are you focusing on? And of course, I'm drawing a blank but to give a good example. But if you know you're you're doing you know, 19th century or you know Reconstruction, you're doing women yeoman women farmers within that. I, you know, don't just sort of uh, you know give that to me very quickly so that I know exactly what you're doing. Also, give me um, uh, an idea of what a reader will gain from the project. In other words what is missing from the his historiography that you are going to add to that. Um, give me a uh, description of the book's target market. Um, you know, this is very basic. Is it um, a book for young adults? Is it a book for scholars? Is it a book for a general reader? Um, is it a regional trade book? Is it a book of national interest? Um, and also your understanding of how the book would be positioned in the marketplace. Um, what are other books like that book, and how is it different from that book? Um, there's a movie, it just occurred to me, this movie where producers, it's a Hollywood producer, and they're, and they're talking about, well, it's like Logan's Run, <laughs> plus, um, it, plus this book, plus, um, plus this movie, plus this movie, but if it were made by right. George Cukor. That's and it's it's in the in the in the um, you can movie. overdo it, but if you do it right, it's yeah, it, it is actually helpful because you're shorthanding everything, mm -hmm. and that does that does sort of resonate with me because I know that you have a sort of a facile understanding, at least, of you know how books will be perceived in the marketplace, and that's that's important um, because once we make the book, we've got to sell it, and you have to be able to um, participate in that process. Um, then I, I also want to know just the sort of the nuts and bolts of the book. How, how long is it going to be? When are you going to get it done if it's not already done? Um, if you're sending me a proposal rather than a finished manuscript. Uh, how many uh, photographs or illustrations are going to be in the book? Um, what are they going to be like? And I also like to know um, what's the status of the permissions? Are these all images that are in the public domain or are these photographs that you've taken yourself as um, you know, like a nature guide that we have? The author took 90% of the photographs herself. That makes it wonderfully easy. Um, are these books that are going to be, I'm sorry, images that we're going to need to get from Getty? Um, so then I see dollar signs, and that's sort of terrifying to be able to, to have to deal with Getty. Or some museums. Um, museums are putting more and more things online, but that's also really expensive. Um, also, tell me about the book. Um, is it going to be an oversized book, standard six by nine book? Um, I mentioned all the tentative schedule for the completion of the book. Um, if there's an introduction 
if there is to be an introduction to your book, I'd really like to see that, even if it's only in draft form, because again, that, that, that you give me this small pitch, the elevator pitch, then you expand in your introduction. If it's a really good introduction, gosh, I know this is the book that I would like to acquire because I have a full sense of it. Um, so if you're gonna give any samples of an unfinished manuscript, I think the introduction should be one of the one or two or three chapters that you give. Um, I also want to see your um, bibliography, again, to know that you have a grasp of um, the historiography, that you're well-versed in your subject, that they are um, up-to-date. Uh, when, when I get a project and, and there are no, you know, there are no um, scholarly sources quoted past you know, the year 1990, you know, I know that was done as a dissertation um, back in the day when I, when I was in school. And, um, you know, I, I just, it, it's just not current, and, and it's, it's not something that I, that alone is gonna kind of uh, be a big strike against you. And also, uh, finally, a copy of your resume. Um, I, I do lots of books. You'd be surprised at the, the amount of science that um, is, are generated by amateur scientists, astronomers, um, bug people, snake people, and they're very well respected within the field. So you don't have to be attached to a university. You don't have to be a PhD to publish with the university press by any means. But I do like to know um, something about you just because we're gonna be in business together. I, you, know, you should know a little bit something about me. I should know a little bit of something about you. So that's what I want. I want quick, you know, a short, a short sharp pitch. And then I want to have these elements that develop that my understanding of the book. And the more interested I become, the more and more I read. Um, the, I'm gonna say one final thing. I'm dominating the conversation, no. but um, please don't call me. And um, I will never forget this. At, my, at the old company that Allison mentioned, someone called me and started pitching their book. And I had read nothing. She was just going on and on. And I said, well, you know, it'd be really helpful to me if you could send me a written, synopsis of you know what you're describing he said well let me just let me just tell you i'm so much better at speaking than writing <laughs> yeah. that Have you ever had that? all the time i mean oh the my phone, gosh the phone is an evil device and should be ne never used um not not for what we're talking about and y y this happens more than I would. I, I mean, really? I have, I, 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 have I have people to stop that from happening yeah, it yeah. still works its way through uh -huh. and um it's just not helpful. Or, or, or if people want to sit down and have coffee to talk about, to pitch, really, we need to see something on paper and then, and then have coffee yeah. would be very useful. And honestly, there are times when I'll break that rule because the, the scholar who, who has come is, is um, you know, so august or whatever, I, 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 I'll, I'll just, I'll break my own rule and go and do it. And, and, and some of those have been useful coffees, but I think it's much better to get things on paper and no time like the present so that the, the editor, if you're going right to, uh, to, to a press or the agent, has some basis for the conversation and, and, some, and can ask intelligent questions and can probe you and, and, and push mm -hmm. you. It's just much, much better. Um, I would say that in a perfect world, of course, you would somehow know, either because you've done it before, or you've read a book, or, or you've just intuited and divined it, and you know exactly how to write a killer proposal, and it comes to me. It's happened, maybe I could count it on, on my hand, a few times, and that's incredible, when someone is just that sure-footed and anticipates everything and comes with a, with a dynamic proposal that ne maybe needs one line edit, and mm -hmm. then you can um, take it out onto the market. That rarely happens, it rarely aligns that way. And in fact, it doesn't really have to happen that way. Do I didn't really have a presentation so much as just a, a, a few sets of comments uh, yeah. about thinking about how you go about finding a publisher that's right for you, whether that's in the university press world, whether that's in a trade world, whether that's in uh, the sort of quasi world that is independent presses such as Coffee House, Tin House. Mm -hmm. Uh, Grey Wolf and people like that. So I didn't really have anything prepared and our website's already up there, so that's one of the things I even had. Um, so rather than me give a spiel, um, which I, you know, I can do that, I'd ha I'm happy to do that, but I think an actual conversation yeah. between so we'll the three go, of us. We'll yeah. loop, loop back to yeah. where we were then. We've already so given our spiels. Um, so what I was <laughs> starting, to, we were talking about a 
about proposals and what, what they send to us, mm -hmm. what is helpful uh, and what is not helpful. Right. The not helpful is phone calling, like yeah. either cold calling to pitch, yeah. which happens more than one would think it right. ought to, or, or, or the sort of reaching out, like I'd like to set up a coffee, and that's where I'm going to first hear about the project, which right. is it's not efficient. And um, again, much, much better to, to give more rather than less. And I will say, yeah. though, that um, no, I don't like phone calls either. Mm -hmm. I don't think uh, neuro uh, editors are by nature neurotic and um, agoraphobic to some degree. So um, having to deal with spontaneous conversation is not the easiest path for us. However, I do think that sometimes if there's been an email b prior, uh, that a coffee conversation can be useful, especially, uh, I, I know, Pat, you do a de good deal of art and photography projects. I do a little bit as well. So anything where there's like hands-on where I need to see things to sort of get a visual oh, sense. Oh, totally. Yeah, and that, like that, that can be actually and more that useful. I would categorize yeah. as once we've already seen enough right. to know that we then need the conversation or we may even need to, as you say, to sit down at a big table and, uh, and, and actually yeah, lay it's it the out. visual, yeah. right. But, um, but, but first to find a way to, to pitch meaningfully. Right. Well, the other thing, the way that Walter and I, who work at the University of Georgia Press, a scholarly press, which is a peer-reviewed press, in our particular press, we have what we call an early decision meeting, which is what if we have any doubt about a project or if it, it sometimes in my case, it's gonna be very expensive to produce. I'm gonna make sure everybody's on board before um, we commit to the project. Or maybe, Walter, I'm speaking to you, but maybe if you have a project that is, uh, you're not 100% sure about, we can present it at these kinds of meetings. We have to yeah. have something to take to our colleagues and say, are we all on board with this? And, right. and you know, not to hammer that point, but you know, that's why we have to have that. We have to have some, you know, a well-developed proposal to share. Also, we're gonna be sending it eventually to scholars for the peer review. And I can't call them and say, hi, let me tell you about this conversation right. I had. What do you like about that? So, yeah. And eventually, you're gonna have to write it for somebody, so you might as well write it for me. Right. Or, or, or to Walter. And even beyond sort of the acquisition sort of our end of it, like it, you know, writing a book proposal, that sort of overview, that sort of a pitch of a cover letter, the conversation that you would have with Pat or, or Robert or myself, it's useful from a marketing perspective as well. It's useful to get you to think about who is the actual audience for this book or audiences. Um, who, who do you think, uh, in my case, I do mostly scholarly monographs and edited collections. Uh, which courses would adopt this book? Uh, where, you know, where do you see this fitting within the discipline? It's good to think about that now, uh, not just from our end in terms of editorial peer review, but eventually you're going to have to say those kinds of things to a marketing department who's going to ask you, like, where do you want this reviewed? Uh, which conferences should this book go to potentially? Uh, uh, should it go to something like the Cater Book Festival in September? You know, like, is that appropriate for it? And like, and so thinking through those sorts of things at the proposal stage is very, very good for us. You know, I don't know. I've worked at a couple of different university presses. This is the first one where we have that first press that I've worked for that's had that sort of early decision conversation. Which the way this works, and it's it's ideal. It's really, actually, really wonderful. Is that members of the editorial department get together with the business office, with the marketing department, and with editorial, uh, with regard to production and design, so that we're all in a conversation about, uh, about the book. For me, it's less a, tr a measure of expense. Uh, what, you know, it might be whether I'm doing something, a book that's slightly out, it's really interesting to me, but it's slightly outside of the core disciplines that the press does, and so, I want to make sure our marketing department is on board with something that's a little bit more, uh, not avant-garde, that's the wrong word, but um, a little bit maybe more progressive or, or turning in a different direction than what we typically do. If I might say too, also, n maybe not even a content, but just the fact that it's outside the discipline that we do, we are going to have to figure out how to market that exactly. book. So right. um, it's, what are the journals, as you said, that kind of thing. So it's not, it's, sometimes it's the content, but right. say, I'm, I'm just, the discipline really is outside our own. Yeah, and so it, as an example of this, uh, a book that I'm acquiring, I'm really excited about, is a memoir by a guy named Dustin Par Parsons uh, that he takes all the sort of exploded view diagrams. Like if you were ever a mechanic or dealt with any sort of like diagrams, you see like a carburetor and like it all the component parts. Uh, and they're all labeled uh, as, you know, this is a screw, this is a bolt. This is, I'm being really basic because I know 
shack all about cars. Um, but with each one of those labels is part of the essay. So he's embedding the text within uh, these sorts of expl exploded view diagrams, public mm -hmm. domain things. Um, so it's a memoir, but it's also, uh, from a design standpoint, from a production standpoint, that presents a lot of complications about how it you sounds expensive. That out. Yeah, saying. well, it, it's yeah. in black and white. Oh, okay. Leave me alone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's a really cool project. We do a lot of creative nonfiction and memoir, so it's not that it's outside of our discipline, but it's not just. Um, Oh, well, I was going to point to that, but it doesn't matter. Uh, it's not just text on you know six yeah. inch by nine inch book. It's something that's going to be a lot more complicated. It probably is going to be more the size of this, except flipped like this. Uh, so there's a lot to think about. Um, the more looping back around to that proposal question, the more that you sort of give an understanding of what this book is, uh, you know, textually, visually, uh, in terms of market, the better it is for everybody involved. Yeah. from agents on down the line. And I, and I think, you know, it depends where you're, one thing we haven't uh, covered yet is the distinction between university presses and trade presses. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and they have different needs and different opportunities. <coughs> and if you, to some extent, hopefully you can anticipate some of these questions or the answers to them, um, but you might not be able to necessarily. You may just need other, other uh, voices to help you do it. But um, if you were seeing this, for Crown, you know, which is very different from, you know, you, you, you want to go to Amanda Cook at Crown versus Timothy Mantle at University of Chicago Press, two outstanding, almost legendary or legends in the making editors at two different very, very fine presses right. with slightly different needs. And it's not to say that Timothy, uh, you know, Mantle, just like you guys, isn't publishing into the trade too. Right. Witness Alice Goffman, you know, which was then picked up by, uh, by Picador for paperback, nice. and, and then I think Alice Goffman's working with FSG now, and and Picador for her next next book. But um, you know, but but you know, so Alice Goffman made that stop with with Tim Mennell, but you know, uh, Matthew Desmond went right to Amanda Cook at Crown. I mean, so you're trying to figure out partly where could you go, but I think more interestingly or more importantly is where would it be best published. And a corollary of that is where will it not be compromised? Right. If you, nobody wants to compromise, least of all you folks who are scholars, and many of you have university appointments, you know, and depending on where you are in tenure, that could be even more sensitive, right? But, you know, but it's possible that Amanda Cook and Crown would be just the right place to do it. And it has so much upside that you would not just be failing yourself by not doing that, but maybe even failing the idea and the transmission of the idea. I mean, I think Matthew Desmond, that was state of the art, agenting, pub writing, <laughs> agenting, publishing the, the, all the way. And this is how he's cleaned up with however many awards now, NBCC, Pulitzer, et cetera. But um, if you are thinking of going to Amanda Cook, then, and you are trying to go into that realm, you, you, you will absolutely need an agent. I don't think you can do it with, without. That agent may find you, you may find that agent, um, you know, and, and there are many ways it can play out. But if you, if you are soliciting the agents and, and you have no reason to think they're going to know about you and you're not at the Radcliffe Institute, you know, where they're handing out a booklet of right. prepackaged ideas, one of which was Henrietta Lacks and, uh, and so on and so forth, then, then, then you are going to want to try, in no time like the present, to hammer out a proposal. And, uh, and hopefully you'll have friends who've done this, or you'll read one of those books, or again, you'll just divine or intuit it. Um, and it's not to say that uh, this agent or Jill Neerham won't want to further tease apart that, that proposal and, and, and push you further, but at least it will be something, a basis of conversation. Sure. And it will do a lot of what Patrick was saying, which is anticipating marketing quite, I mean, you, you would even have a marketing section because you know that that's what a, a proper proposal will have. <coughs> you know, teasing out, well, where, what is the state of the field? What are the omissions? What, which, which sort of uh, lacunae are you filling? Which are the bad projects that you need to slap down and, and refute? Yeah, exactly. and, and that kind of thing. I mean, to say nothing of the most, I mean, every part of the proposal is essential. You need your lungs, your heart, and your brain. You need them all, unfortunately. But, 
you know, the, they're all important, but I mean, the, the overview, which is the seduction part, is especially important simply because it's the first thing that anyone's reading. The first thing, and in, in so many cases, uh, I don't know about you, but we receive hundreds of submissions per year, so I would say per month, and so, uh, so often that seduction is the only part uh, and so it needs, and, and so it needs to be particularly strong. I have a question for you, Robert. Uh, uh, Pat and I primarily don't work with agents. We get probably a lot more sort of cold calls uh, than you do. What would you recommend to uh, you know people who have potential projects in terms of what they should see in approaching an agent as opposed to approaching a press directly, such as a, a mid-sized web, such as us? Uh, or even a Chicago, which is larger than the mid-size, but it's well, still I not think, Oxford. I, th I think, I mean, you can answer the question a couple of ways, but let's start with poetry, even though that's not what you were asking. But but it, but it's a, but it's a good but it's yeah. a good side uh, sideways way to answer the question. The reason why most poets don't have um, agents is that they don't need them. Is that it's not really. Well, if you wanted to be really sort of jaundiced about it, you'd say, well, the money isn't usually very big because the agents aren't interested. Right. But, but coming at it from the other angle, they don't need them. There's a whole infrastructure of quarterlies, prizes, competitions, you know, the, the, the many, for many of which the, the, the major part of the prize is simply getting published yeah. with a small press or Real, independent press. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, well, that, that, the big kahuna, yeah, yeah. but, but even, even below that. And so they don't need them, and uh, and, the, and and there is a kind of journeyman sort of sequence of uh, of achievements and recognition that leads all to the all the way to the point where you might get an agent. Another reason why some poets do have agents is that they may be doing different kinds of books as well at the same time, and ma right. many more of them are doing that. I mean, Kevin and Natasha being two two easy examples here. But um, so I don't think you always need them. And moving to other fields of, be it memoir or, 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 or even scholarship, uh, that, you know, I think that depending on where you're going, you might even see an agent as being a nuisance. Someone at certain university presses and certain independent presses might see us as nuisances half the time or a quarter of the time. I mean, I think there are places that, that do sort of both. I think Gray Wolf would fall into this category where they really raw with the authors about half the time and with agents about half the time. And then there are many, um, I'm sure, LSU press would rather not have heard from us. Right. And there are many quarterlies that feel that way. And actually will tell us, we really don't want to hear from you. Don't, <laughs> don't submit your client's short story. Um, whereas the New Yorker or the Atlantic will want to use us simply as a covering me mechanism. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true in among I know that the trade houses almost, that's not, I think it's a, an overstatement to say they won't deal with material that's unagented, but I think it's not much of an overstatement. very unlikely, yeah. 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 And, 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 I, and I will say, where we do deal with agents is with regard to creative nonfiction. That's not just memoir, uh, but that's cultural criticism, that's a variety of different things. And we don't find them to be a nuisance only, <laughs> it, it, we don't. Uh, because, uh, it, they're there to protect our authors. There's, right. there's a very clear reason for them to be there. I will say that the one issue that uh, Georgia has, and this happens with other sort of mid-sized scho uh, scholarly presses when they do general interest trade books, is uh, not so much royalties, but I think with the expectation mm -hmm. of sales. Uh, and so it becomes as much of a marketing concern. So where we see mm -hmm. things like contracts having sort of changes, it's in putting in clauses about particular marketing initiatives that will take place uh, within, you know, within our sort of operation of the book. Right. Uh, and which so may not be realistic. Which may not, well, and that's yes. where the annoyance comes right. in. And so, so, but a lot of that is simply just tamping down expectations. You know, w you know a successful, you know, for instance, the Harry Cruz biography that we did last year. So that, it, that you did. Uh, uh, but what marketing did in terms of making it a successful book, uh, was very successful, but by our standards, successful is three to four thousand copies over the course of a year. Sure. Goes to paperback. Uh, it got reviewed uh, well in, uh, in Publishers Weekly and the New York Times Book Review. That was great and very useful. Uh, those expectations uh, are sometimes we're having to tell the agent, who then has to tell the author, that you know the possibility of this selling fifteen thousand copies or something mm -hmm. like that through our press is 
not realistic. And that may mean uh, that may mean that you ought to be thinking about it as repressed. It may also mean that you may have to have more realistic expectations about the nature of your project in the first place. Well, That's a conversation. The, some yeah. of the agents may, may, or maybe they ought to be happier than they <coughs> seem to be from where you sit. Right. Because one problem you will have, I have a book that I sold, uh, a client of mine named Eitan McKaylee, uh, who's just a wonderful person and a wonderful scholar, independent scholar, he doesn't have an appointment. Um, he worked for the uh, Chicago Defender and um, he is a Jewish American, child of Holocaust uh, refugees. He's not black. Uh, he went to University of uh, Chicago and wanted to get a job. He actually wanted to be a novelist, but he wanted to get a job in a newspaper and sort of, sort of lucked into, stumbled into, didn't even understand. He had no idea of what this institution was or its history and thus began you know, <laughs> an illustrious and very moving and it shaped him in, a, in, a, in, a, in countless ways. Many years later, having started a nonprofit in Chicago in the housing projects, uh, he started a nonprofit called We the People Media. They were basically creating a newspaper from within the projects, or written by and for them, you know, which is hundreds of thousands of people before Rahm Emanuel sort of blasted it apart uh, into a million pieces and, and sent them farther out. Uh, the pe the residents of yes, and um, so many years later, he, he came to me with this with this thought of uh, of writing a. Uh, you know, sort of a definitive account of what the Chicago Defender was, what role it played well beyond Chicago, uh, the coalescing of black political pilot nationally. And, uh, and, and so here was some person, he, he, he came, we, we hammered out a proposal, we sold it. It wasn't a feeding frenzy, but we sold it to a really gifted uh, editor at Houghton Mifflin, uh, um, before it was Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, actually. They hadn't yet merged named George Hodgman, who later became famous for a, for a book called Betty Bill, um, after he spun off of our world. But uh, anyway, we published it. Big tome of a book, um, fantastic reviews. Brent Staples wrote it a love letter in the New York Times book review. It uh, was a New York Times notable book. It was a finalist for the Michael Linton Prize. Um, but we sold, I, I want to say, is it eight and a half? thousand or something of this, maybe even cruising nine. Which we'd be thrilled by. Yes, and, and they have not put it into paperback. Mm -hmm. Now, University of Georgia Press would have nailed the, the 3,000, the 5,000, whatever it might have been, mm -hmm. and you it would have had your full support, and you would have put it right into paperback where it should live, where it will live, you know, that's. Yeah. Instead, we're shackled with this, you know, huge $35 or more, 36, 50. Book, hardback book that's very hard for course adoption anymore. And yeah. the difficulty there, and this is something that a university press might be prepared for that a trade house might not, is that this brick of a book that's 600 pages, you think that's expensive for a hardback to be $38 or whatever, but it's not. Right. And what, the, what that means is part of the reason that they're not putting it into paperback right. is they can't probably realistically price that in a paperback version. That's gonna be that That's much. gonna be that much less than the hardback. So they're stuck too yeah. in, yeah, in yeah, a yeah, lot yeah. of ways. Um, you know, and it's the sort of thing like, that's a really cool project. And, and I'm gonna nerd out a little bit here and say that um, I'm starting a print culture in the South series specifically because I'm interested in periodical culture mm -hmm. uh, and the way magazines and newspapers sort of promulgated American culture and that there's not enough of that sort of thing. Like there should have been, a, a, you know. A the press equivalent of historiography. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Sh yeah. Journalistography. Yeah, yeah, and like, and there should have been a history of the Chicago Defender, you know. Some time ago. 20 know, years ago. Yeah. And there really hasn't been. There's an odd absence. Yeah. Th there's an odd, well, there's an odd absence about black newspaper and magazine culture, period. Uh, like we don't have histories of, you know, the, you know, the San Francisco Elevator or the Memphis Eagle or, you know, the variety of papers. We don't have a, that single source. Sorry, I'm nerding out because it's something that, like, we need more of. That's a, is such an important shaper. You know, these are places where James Baldwin, where Ralph Ellison, where Albert Murray, where, where, uh, where a variety of people were first published before they broke through the, the New York publishing market. They were being published in black newspapers. So why don't we have histories? And of covering them. Emmett Till. Yeah, yeah and covering up. important no. issues. You know, the reason why the civil rights began gaining so much traction in the American media was not just because they were being published, they were thought about in the New York Times, they were being published in black newspapers first, doing these sorts of work, 
So we don't have a history of that, and we need not just one, but a lot of histories of that. So I'm standing because I thought you might have some questions for our, our guests. Martha. Yes, um, some years ago I was about 100 pages into a book-length memoir, and uh, I was persuaded by Bob Outline uh, to um, start publishing pieces of it. He said that was the professional way to go. So I've now published four uh, sections of this book-length memoir, and I'm wondering, they're pretty short, so I don't think I'm even halfway into the book, but how much, at what point should I stop publishing short pieces if I still want to get a book published? That's an interesting question, and it depends on two things. Um, well, it depends on one thing first, and then I'll figure out the second piece, sorry. <laughs> um, if the memoir is organized as a series of discrete essays, as opposed to, as to say that they are standalone pieces, um, you still don't want to you know, publish, my rule of thumb is always 25 to 30%. Like I don't want to see more than that being previously published elsewhere. Uh, that's particularly important, I think, if they're standalone discrete essays that can stand, that, you know, it's not a single through line narrative in the way, that, you know, a memoir such as, I don't know why this is coming to my head, uh, uh, Gregor Boulier's Report on Myself, um, great, slim, tiny book, very weird. But it's not a series of pieces, it's one thought through piece. And so he had less of a difficulty, you know, selling pieces of that everywhere because I think readers knew that they still needed the full book to get the breadth of the experience in a way that a series of discrete essays uh, would be different. The same way that a short story collection um, is the same way. Um, and uh, my phone's ringing, that's probably uh, the flu's problem. <laughs> <laughs> you laugh, but, <laughs> uh, but since I just gave a police or report. Aflac. Yeah, or, or, yeah, or progressive. So yeah, I mean, my rule of thumb is still 25 to 30%. Like I don't want it. I don't want more than that. Can I just yeah. jump in one Yeah, thing? please do. You it's also want to make sure you're, 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 you're leaving if, because I, this is a question, or, Walter, are part. you, right, I mean, are, when you say the 30%, is that in total, including for a serial, or previous, because you will also want to be, hopefully, or your marketing department will want to be placing one, maybe two, around publication, either just before, during, or just after. Yeah. And so, and, and you, I'm not, I'll, I'll give you, an, flesh this out with an example. So Gregory Pardlow, who won the Pulitzer in Poetry in 2015, uh, but was also, as the New York Times told us when I first encountered him in the, in the paper, that he was also getting a, an MFA in uh, creative nonfiction. So he was studying with someone I'd worked with before, Philip Lopate, and so I called up and said to Philip, oh my God, is this person represented? And he said no, but here's his email, and I reached out. And, and so we, um, and in fact, he did have a, 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 a sort of a memoir and essays that was that was already underway called Air Traffic, which title actually Philip uh, um, anointed it with, which is the title of one of the essays, Air Traffic. And uh, so we started working on it, but he had already published one or two of these discrete essays that, you know, very well turned, but they do sort of necklace together, you know, to create a whole. And we began, and I wanted, I wanted to publish one of these in the New Yorker in order to sell it. So I had submitted it to Cresciola Lyshawn. She, she just takes forever to get back to it. So I ended up just going out with it. We sold it to Knopf, and then, you know, Many months into its its being owned by them, but I still I this was still out with Cressida. So eight months later, she's like, "Yeah, I love it. I really want it." <laughs> <laughs> so we we so you know, and then in the end, David Remnick said, "No, he he loved it too, but he didn't th see it for the." So we ended up doing it for Page Turner for the electronic uh, part of, oh, yeah. of the New Yorker. But in any event, they weren't thrilled with us because here we were giving some of the precious jewels away. Um, I think what finally convinced them to allow that, and, and then there was another that um, that John Freeman had taken for Freeman's. So, so already this this thing we were already getting to that we were cruising 20, 25 percent now, <laughs> and, and we weren't even nearly to publication. Right, I think year out, what probably. saved us in the end is that he has this fantastic essay, which is I think the last essay or the penultimate one in the collection. Um, I haven't read the, the final version yet. 
um, which is about a reality TV show that his brother was in. He was a, actually had a 15 or 20, 17 minutes of fame as a recording artist. Um, I forget the name of the group, but also had a drug problem. And so he was on this thing that was short live uh, reality show called Intervention. It may have had an explanation point. <laughs> <laughs> oh and so the whole <laughs> family <laughs> had. <laughs> so Gregory Pardlow, this fantastic gentleman scholar and gentle artist, was actually on a reality show, which nobody really knows. And so he wrote this piece that is, you know, like many of the things, as beautiful as it is, sort of cringy um, in, in this essay, Air Track. So they have that. So they, they basically forgave us, but we were pushing it because yeah. they wanted that exposure at publication. Right. When is your work, when are you completing the work? Um, I'm not sure. Mm. Well, I, I, if I can sort of dumb down what you, this, what your explanation, you want hype? Yeah. Leading up to it, but then at a certain point you, you don't, you want it to stop. So it's all, it's almost about timing as much as it is totally. about the message. Yeah. Okay. So. And not cannibalizing yourself. So you want the hype, but not to the point that you're cannibalizing yourself. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, and, you, and you, you, you don't want it too soon. So I have an author who's doing a, a really cool project on um, rituals of Southern femininity uh, across college campuses, looking at debutante balls, looking mm -hmm. at um, uh, sorority hazing, looking at the variety of things. She published a really great piece in the book, uh, for the book in, uh, I wanna say Washington Post, um, two years ago. Uh, it, that book is nowhere near being done, uh, but she announced that her bio said, you know, forthcoming and imminent, which is not true. Yeah. Uh, and so there can be a case where like too much early advanced hype, like you kill, you've created buzz for the book and then it doesn't happen or it doesn't happen for a long time and then it's subsequently sort of forgotten. Or there's so much in You could the also order. invite predators. Yeah, well that's, that's the true. thing Jackals I was scared Jackals and vultures, yeah. they're all around. That's the thing that actually really scared me because it's a really exciting topic. Uh, you know, it involves race, it involves femininity. It's the title may be good, you can't yeah. copyright a title. Watch yeah. out for the jackals and the vultures. <laughs> uh, so we had a question Sorry, right here. Yeah, this It does vary, vary from press to press, but it also varies by discipline, frankly. Uh, so I give, for instance, a lot more of that sort of critical red pin, minus blue, whatever, um, hands-on attention to the creative, to the creative nonfiction aspect of what I acquire in. Uh, I, I find that that's the stuff that needs the most sort of delicate help with regard to style, with regard to sort of organization and structure. Uh, with regard to just any sort of rhetorical finesse. Um, there are you know, some of the scholarly work that I acquire in um, some of the history, for instance, it gets published as part of, not a prize series, but a series of books. Uh, and so it's not just me looking over that text, it's a series of series editors, scholars at other, not other presses, but other institutions who are also taking a crack at that. So I don't put as much sort of emphasis and it's that sort of line by line edit with those kinds of books. So it's really gonna vary uh, even within the press depending on the discipline that you're working on. It's something to ask. Um, you know, I think editors will be normally pretty frank about that. Uh, you know, and we do also at a university press, we do have the help that all of our books, even the creative nonfiction, go out for independent external peer review, which is, you know, review of the work by, you know, experts or peers within the discipline, around range of disciplines. And so that helps us sort Sometimes of call. Sometimes twice, right? Before, yeah, at before least, you acquire, yeah, usually, yeah. And then before you usually acquire. twice, usually at the proposal stage and at the manuscript stage. And sometimes it's a, at a third stage. And that's usually two scholars per review. So like there's a lot of different feedback going through that. So I don't, you know, looking at the early life of the Natchez Indians, um, or the remains of the Creek and Chickasaw here. Like I, I do a lot in early America studies. 
I'm not an early Americanist by in, in you know by implication or you know by what my training is. So I really do rely a lot more on scholars who are uh, cultural criticism, memoir. That you know that's sort of my jam, and so that's much easier for me uh, to feel like an expert, whether I am or not. Uh, in doing the sort of hands-on rigorous work. So it depends largely, like you, if you're doing anything with regard to creative nonfiction or fiction and poetry, you're gonna want someone who's willing to get in the muck a little bit or a lot. Yeah. Is that hard to find or is it something that's hard to find? Well, some of that you're gonna know from writers groups, yeah. you know, and just people in from your MFA program or if you were or, or other writers groups if you're involved uh, again coming back to acknowledgments which Patrick has raised earlier it's, it's an invaluable resource and it's right there because you can actually glean a lot of you, you, they'll say something about how helpful you know the editor was or, or even the agent uh, you know at different points when it was vulnerable when it wasn't there and so um, and it's a dangerous question to ask because everyone was in the resistance but I think that there are people who still do line edit, and yeah. there are people who still do hammer out ideas well before you get to that stage. You just have to find them and, and to some extent be lucky. So. I, um, I, I come from, as Alex mentioned, I used to have a small press, a mom and pop. We did you know, 20 books a year. So I'm used to working with editors, I'm sorry, with authors in a, in a very concrete way. I've, I've been a developmental editor. I, I would take a project, acquire it, develop it, <laughs> line edit it, and then proof it. That's a mom and pop shop. Now we don't do that, although I have an author now who I am driving to tomorrow to get a copy of photograph because she can't do that. And I would n I'm never working with her again, but <laughs> I am happy. And I don't, and that sounds really bitchy, but I, I, I'm never working with her again because I can't. But I am doing everything that I can to make the book as good as it can be. And if I ever do work with her again, it, it, she has to do all that herself, you know? Yeah. So it kind of, it, it is, right. it's kind of luck. I mean, you would get, I'm not suggesting that she's lucky to have me as an editor, but other people would have just rejected this and said, we just can't do that. Can't do this. Because I'm sort of getting in trouble for spending that much time with her. <laughs> yeah, you really, you just have to get lucky with it and, or just, right. and you just know and um, yeah, also just, if I can put in, in a, a pitch for the editor wisdom, you know, really take your editors, don't try to fight your editors. Well, that's right, it's a two-way yeah. street. You know, we can talk <laughs> about their editors who edit or not. They're, they pick up the red pen or red pencil or blue pen. I like blue too, it seems less explosive right. and violent. <laughs> red and and I, it, it sounds sort of ridiculous, but it does have a but better effect true. psychologically. But it, you, you, we can talk about that, whether they're, but it is a two-way street. This whole thing is a dialogue. And it, when it's working well, it's about mutual respect on both sides. Nobody should be issuing marching orders or edicts or, or corrections. But if you interpret them, you as the author or scholar, interpret these line edits, these sort of spillings of ink on the page as probings, challengings, and, and, and suggestions, suggestions that you may take them up on or not, or that may lead to other problem solving that you have that may be better. And the best editorial process is where it is that dialogue and where, you know, I often say just, you know, okay, so I, I've made a lot of mess on your paper. So take three, take one third implicitly, uh, you know, take another third and think hard about it and maybe take some of them or and or solve your other way. And the rest of the time, tell me to fuck off. Right. You know, yeah. you know it, it basically. What I secretly want is for them to do 80% of it. Right. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> but I try very hard. In the spirit of that dialogue, I, I will almost, at my own expense, sort of overstress the extent to which I can be told to fuck off. Right, and it's really important that as, an, as significant, as useful as line editing is, sometimes what you need an editor to do more is to take a look at the whole and right. say, Absolutely. conceptually, yeah. Yeah. this, Talk like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, true developmental is, like, looking at the structure, looking at the right. whole piece and saying, this isn't working, and here's why. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and allow you, again, to have that sort of conversation, because like, right. I am perfectly fine with an author coming back to me and saying, 
I disagree with you. Uh, you know, I think that this is working. I think the peer review doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. Um, so long as you actually make an argument, uh, and so that you're backing this up, you're giving, you know, I, this is fresh on my mind because it just happened last week, uh, had an art, I sent a project out to, for peer review that in retrospect, I did not realize that they were um, philosophically opposed, uh, the author and the, and the peer reviewer. Mm -hmm. They're not philosophically opposed, they used to date. Um, so that's actually well, the larger. Maybe <laughs> right. Um, maybe you have so. a dog. Right, right. It, but these are things I don't know. Yeah. And I, I really don't, don't want to know. know. Yeah. Um, but uh, what the author did very well, I thought, was that she articulated one, that she understood that there was a philosophical debate between what was going on between my reading of the text, the peer reviewer's reading, and her writing of it, and that there was a conflict, uh, and that this is a conflict. She, well, she contextualized it. She placed that context in the field of discussion about Caribbean studies. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not gonna geek out too much about that, but uh, you know, there's less studies on Portuguese-led colonies than there are Francophone and Anglophone colonies, so primarily because most people who speak English who are English historians don't also read Portuguese. It's as basic as that. Um, <laughs> uh, and so she, uh, she articulated the depth of that sort of argument and why she was intervening in the way she, she was. And she articulated well that while she respected this philosophical difference, this is why she's going the way she goes. And that was great for me. Uh, one, because I learned something, frankly. Uh, and, and two, because she, she really outlined well what it was her project was trying to do and what it's not trying to do. Uh, and I think that's, um, I know we keep going back to the proposal stage. It's, a, it's really important to articulate not only what your project is doing, but articulate what it's not trying to do uh, and the ways in which you don't want it to be interpreted. Uh, and uh, that's a really useful thing to have and to think about. Um, and then I see you. I want to take one more yeah. question and then before you actually ask beyond our and, and just before you do that, just the, absolutely, the global uh, conceptual stuff, that has to happen, uh, absolutely. I didn't mean to suggest that one rushes to line editing. That is just sort of a fun sort of, uh, sort of stage in the process to talk about. But of course, there are several different stages yeah. before you yeah. get there. And it's almost more important, all of that, that dialogue is not less important earlier, if anything. And, and in fact, a lot of agents are doing that kind of work. With, at, especially, with again, in nonfiction than, yeah. proposal stage, yeah. 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 Dorothea, and then we'll So I was actually interested in sort of the elevator pitch that you guys talked about. What do you want to see or hear in the elevator pitch? One thing that, that um, I'm thinking about the book you did, you recently got, The Mothers of Gynecology, the, ne the Name of Change. Right. Um, this book, it, well, I, I mean, I don't even need to use that example. If your book is the first book on the subject ever, the first book written treatment, say it. Yeah. But it should be true. <laughs> 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 um, we, yeah. we, we often get that. It's the first one. And then, you know, it's like two minutes in the Library of Congress or Amazon. We're like, no, there's, you know, right. whatever. To me, an elevator pitch is something that, you know, if you met someone at a party and you said, I'm writing a book, you'd, and you, you knew that you had no idea what that person's um, frame of reference was or what their area of expertise, you would just try to interest them in it. That, to me, is a, is a perfectly valid way of doing it. Because I have to read a couple of sentences and go like, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. do, 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 and you hook me in. Having said that, yeah. I mean, an elevator pitch, you know, can be, uh, we can overestimate the importance of an elevator pitch from where you sit. An elevator pitch becomes more and more important into these offices and sales conference or you know right. all you know marketing. When when you've got a when you've got a catalog and you're sending out a sales force, they've got depending on which house and which account and whether you know maybe thirty seconds, maybe yeah, a maybe minute minutes. to talk about your thing. So there, th so by that point it needs to be hard. But 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 that's well down the road, and it's not necessarily something that you guys need to obsess about. I think uh, you know just communicating validly and honestly the importance of the idea, your genuine earned enthusiasm for the idea, the general contours and, and you know parameters of it, and you know and you know who you are, 
what, what, what are your affiliations? What is your SSA platform, you know, if you have one? Because that's very important. You know, if you, were a, if you were a fiction writer, where have you been published? I mean, all these bona fides that are important to get up right up front so that we know it. For, and for us, that's the more important element of pitch. And it's also really important to me that when you're making this sort of elevator pitch, you're not just doing it to a blank wall. You're doing it to a specific press. So it's really helpful for me with reading a cover letter to read someone who is, say, doing a work on uh, Atlantic world studies of you know the 1790s or something to acknowledge and to talk about. Uh, this is where this book fits in with your list. You know, you've done this book and this book, mm -hmm. and this is sort of an intervention here. And like having that knowledge and understanding of where it fits with us, that's really important. I mean, that for um, general interest, for a large general interest publisher, that may be a little bit less important. But for a specialized publisher, such as a university press or a small independent press, they pick and choose which subjects they publish in. And so having that elevator pitch. Uh, demonstrate a clear understanding of where your project fits within our press, that's really, really valuable. Um, so don't just treat it as a cold call, actually research your press. Um, so, yeah. And then there was someone. Hi, I'm yeah. about midway through a biography that I'm doing, and uh, I am very concerned with staff that will be dropping to the end of the page. Oh, bless you. No. Uh, I mean, what I would say is, it, first of all, it depends on the subject. So, you know, we probably don't need the 256, 800 page biography of Abraham Lincoln, for instance. Like, uh, but for a, a figure who's lesser known, like, you can take a couple of approaches. You can do that sort of introduction to such and such writer or thinker or whatever. Or you can do the, you know, if you, if you think it warrants it, that fully expansive, massive brick of a book that's gonna cost 30 bucks. Um, there's two ways of approaching that. And when you make an, a cover letter, a pitch, or anything about the project, you should articulate which approach you've taken and why you've taken that approach to this person. And work. where it's coming, at which, right. at which stage in the field's development. Yeah. You know, for instance, I sold something uh, to Little Brown recently, uh, by a woman named Diane Jacobs that was, it, it's, it's called Love and War, Edith Wharton in Paris. So we've got R. W. B. Lewis, we've got the letters, we have the biography, that field is set, the, ma the most, not just magisterial biographies, but award winners and their classics right. in, in that field, if we're calling Edith Wharton herself a field. So what we wanted to do was just to take this 13 years and what that is. So go in a little bit deeper. That was the angle. Yeah. There's another uh, biography that I, I sent, sold to Vicki Wilson at Canal, uh, which, which is called Art in the Light of God. And it's going to a subject that you would think, how on earth would you encourage anyone to do this? Vincent van Gogh. It's been like, it's just, <laughs> how Jesus much more can Christ. you say? <laughs> it's so blue chip, it's just impossible. But he has an angle, and so his angle, and again, he's going to be writing something that's, you know, in, in the range of yours, maybe a little bit longer. It won't, be, it won't be slim, I would say, but it will not be a tome. It'll be maybe 350, 370 max. It's called Art and the Light of God, and it's looking at his painting as a religious mission. He was, after all, a failed priest. That is what he wanted to do. That is what his family urged him, please be an artist. It was the one family, they were like, could you not? Because he was so zealous, he was, so, he was turning people off. He could, <laughs> you know, Michael, no one will work with you. I was the best tomato, no. They, they didn't yeah. want him to be a priest, so he became an artist, and that was his ministry. And, and the thing is, no one else had, 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 had covered this, certainly not in the trade. Uh, maybe one, I think one Dutch sort of PhD candidate talked talk about it. But, 
And so, and yet this is what he wrote. So they recently reissued all those letters and he'd written in great detail about the fact that, that was a, that's the only reason he painted. He had no real background. He learned to, to draftsmanship and painting sort of later to solve this problem with his life and to, to show people the light. Well, it's 5.15. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. I brought catalogs. Yeah. Yeah, they're up there. <laughs> they're out the there. materials on the crit yeah. and they're right outside the door. I brought proposal guidelines uh, for okay. our press, but also they're just good overviews, things to look at and think good about. Habits. Yeah. So, thanks.